take us back to the beginning. How did you discover your passion for storytelling and the arts? Oh, wow. That's a great, that's a really great question. I was in high school and a friend of mine convinced me to come to an audition for a musical theater production that was going to be happening in the summer. And I mean, I kind of could dance at that point. Like I had sung in my church, but that was a, it was a game changer. Mm. Like I was just a kid from the Chicago suburbs. And all of a sudden I spent an entire summer, like painting the set, dancing, going to like sell playbill ads. And it was the first time that I had really been in any kind of cross-cultural environment because they had college students, they had kind of grownups, but like was people of color and gays. And I just, I was like, oh, I have found my tribe. Mm. Like I, this is, I want to be in this environment for the rest of my life. And there it goes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really the thing that compels me more than anything is the collaboration. Just like, let's put a play on in a barn. I'm, st I'm like, I'm still doing it. Now I just produce <laughs> movies, <laughs> same thing. Perfect segue to this next question, but mentorship has been such a cornerstone and driving force in your career. Who were the people in your life who shaped the artists that you are today? Why has it been so important for you to pay it forward? You are kind of blowing my mind. These are great, <laughs> unexpected questions. Well, my the very first choreographer I ever had, his name is Tony Calzaretta. I'm still friends with him. You know, he was seven years older than me and never made me feel like a kid, like always kind of like brought me right in, like, hey, let's let's set this, like I'm gonna teach it to you and then you can teach it to other people. And then right after I did that, then I began to choreograph kind of children's things. And so I feel like he he's the one I immediately go to. I've had, I've had I think I've been mentored by a ton of different actors that I've worked with. Like when I did that 70s show, Kurtwood Smith was so nice to me, mm. so kind, like brought me under his wing. He's red, he's the dad who's supposedly a dick and he was not at all. Like every day he invited me to have lunch with him, just kind of made me feel cozy and comfortable. So it was really, I kind, I just, I learned from that. I mean, anytime I was a guest star on a set and the lead actor like poked their hair head back from being doing hair and makeup and said like, hey, welcome to our set. Like, you know, I'm, we're so glad to have you and how deeply impacted I was by that. And so mm -hmm. when I got into a position of being a producer and being in a place of leadership, I mean, I'm not gonna say I nailed it out of the gate, but my my direction was to create a place that was comfortable and where people could do their best work. And you know, now seven years later, I feel like my um, modus operandi is love bombing. I just mm -hmm. walk around the set and like, hey, you're doing a really great job. Like, I'm so happy you're here. Let me know, do you need anything? Do you need anything? Do you need anything? And mm -hmm. like what that does to help people I mean, I just, again, I think innovation comes when you're relaxed. So like, I think that is, I think people would say like, oh my God, I had a great time working on that set. And I feel responsible for that and really proud of that. Definitely. And you've had so much success throughout your career. When you look back, is there a particular moment that stands out to you? A lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I, when I first came to town in 1995, I'm like really old. Um, I got I got really lucky and did a boatload of Asian commercials for like cash money. And like I it was not dangerous, although that sounds really gross and dangerous. But like I remember one of my first ones, it was Brad Pitt, like when movie stars were doing foreign campaigns mm -hmm. but wouldn't yeah. be caught dead doing an American campaign. And I floated down a lazy river with Brad Pitt drinking. Asian beer. And I was like, whoa, I'm, this is amazing. So I think there was enough of a hook, enough of like grace and kindness. Um, I mean, casting directors who have been so good to me that like brought me in and then told their casting director friends. And 
Like I, during the nine, the late nineties, I mean, I did every must see TV sitcom and that was all the kindness of Dee Dee Bradley telling Tony Sepulveda, telling Ted Hand, tell, I mean, like that, that launched my little baby mm. self. So yeah. I feel like that was great. Um, and then I'm going to give a huge shout out in most recent years to a guy named Jeff Brown, who works at, um, he was HB, he was Warner Brothers Home Entertainment, which is now kind of HBO Max, which is Warner Brothers Pictures. But he brought, he bought the film Dirt that um, I starred in and produced. And since then has spearheaded all of our different like things that were sold to Netflix. Now we have three movies on HBO Max. Like yeah. it's all Jeff. Love him. In addition to the incredible work that you've done on screen, you've also written and produced. How have those experiences behind the camera impacted the way that you approach your work on screen and vice versa? Oh man, it takes the edge off. That's, mm. that's the big thing. Like seeing how the sausage gets made, really is like oh it's not it's not as I mean it is magical when all the pieces come together because the like sum of the total is not equal to the sum of the parts like that magic thing but really when it comes down to casting when like if you're in the room and you're doing an audition and you're being recognized everybody's good so that neurotic thing that like, if I had done it just a little differently, if I like, it starts to go away. Cause it's like, no, 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 there's like an alchemy. Like it's once we cast that guy, then it really needs to be that girl. And then it really mm. needs to be that antagonist. Like it all comes together as a puzzle. And that has really just allowed me a lot more freedom in my acting and my performing. Cause it's like, well, this is for me. Like you'll either like it or you won't, or I'm in the right spot for this puzzle or I'm not, but trying to do something like that's a waste of time. Like mm. to all actors, anybody who can hear me, that is a waste of your time. Like you can't, you can't and like try to read my mind and anticipate exactly what I'm looking for because the truth is I don't know until it all comes together. Yeah. Great advice and a great insight into <laughs> behind the scenes. You know, one of the films that you produce, A Hollywood Christmas, is dropping on December 1st on HBO Max. What can audiences expect from that film? It is a love letter to filmmaking. Yeah. It's a, and it's a love letter to the very traditional Christmas kind of rom com, that formulaic thing that everybody loves to watch. And we just kind of, turn it on its head. So it's meta where the director of a, like a holiday rom-com Christmas movie starts to live her own Christmas movie when the network executive comes to shut her down. So it's a little meta, it's a little farcical, it's a little Moliere, but like if you're a lover of movies about movie making, if you, if Soap Dish was your absolute favorite and you've been waiting for the Christmas version of it, we, brought it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the protagonist in that film has such a distinct reason for why she creates holiday movies. Why do you think mm. this genre has resonated and continues to resonate with audiences? Oh, great. Yeah. You are really, really smart, really good. I mean, <laughs> I'm just, I'm surprised. Um, I think because it makes people feel cozy. You know, I think she has a line in the film that is like, the, you know, the network executive says, isn't it boring? And she's like, is a cup of cocoa boring? No, it's comforting. So I think there is a part of falling in love at Christmas time, Christmas magic saving the day. Like, I think we come to this time of year, everyone's a little tired. The, like, you know, you're kind of wrapping it all out and you want to feel good. And I think those movies are, I mean, they, for kind of all even post pandemic, like as a producer, watching yeah. what trends, watching what catches fire, people want to feel the love. <laughs> like there's, you know, that, I mean, that and superheroes like blowing shit up, but they <laughs> basically same, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And in addition to a Hollywood Christmas, you also have, I believe, in Santa dropping on the 14th on Netflix. Can you tell us about that film and your character in it? Um, I believe in Santa is 
Well, it's it's super, super close to my heart. So it was written by my husband, uh, directed by a really good friend, Alex Rana Ravello. And it we crafted it during the pandemic, like sitting around in our little story hut. And it's this it's to me, it's a story of acceptance. It's basically Lisa, a single mom with a kid, starts dating a guy. They have a sexy summer. They think it's going to be great. And at Christmas, she finds out he believes in Santa Claus. And I think that really when we were writing it and coming up with it, it was a time of terrible unrest and a time of a lot of political kind of garbage. And it was, yeah. how can you just find harmony with somebody who doesn't believe the same things you do? And the idea of like, oh, adults laughing, like he believes in Santa Claus. It's kind of like, well, half maybe if you just had the attitude that like, you believe what you want to believe. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And we'll find a reason to love each other anyway. It was, is a big message that we wanted that movie. I mean, yes, it's funny and a little bit like 40 year old virgin and you know, the, all the kind of rom-com stuff, but really the reason that we wanted to make it and what I feel most proud about is its message of inclusion. Yeah. Did your husband write these characters with the intention for both of you to star in it. How did that come to fruition? Right. Um, no, we we wrote it. It is loosely based on some. I mean, there's a lot. Anytime that my <laughs> husband writes stuff, it's like ripped from our lives. So, you know, and our poor kid, everything she's ever said or thought or done has been put into a film somewhere. I mean, you can't kind of get away from it. But we weren't sure, you know, who would buy it or where it would end up or when it would get made when we were writing it. So I think there's always, yes, like a secret little, please, please, please. But, you know, we've we've written or he's written all kinds of stuff that, you know, it, it was it was a better fit for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it kind of it came about in very organically, like just through the distribution with Netflix, through the different financiers like it. And it, again, we kind of got lucky because it was still, when we shot it, it was still pretty COVID. And so the idea that we were married and lived together and kind of in our own bubble anyway was another part of the puzzle. When you're wearing two different hats for the project, because you not only started it, but you also produce it, how challenging is that to kind of juggle? Well, okay, so going back to one of your very first questions, which was about mentorship, um, one of my dear, dear friends, Ava Redke, who I'm, I, I mean, I could cry. I'm so crazy about her. She started in the company at like six years ago as my assistant oh, cool. and then became my mentee and then went out and produced her own movies. And now like is one of my favorite collaborators. So when it was decided that I would play Lisa about three weeks before production, I passed the football off to her. So I did the development and the casting and the pre-producing. And when we were on set, she was my boss. She was the boss of how all that got done. And it was, I was comforted. I knew that I was in good hands. And then when the movie was finished and we went into post, she we passed the football again. Love that. That's such a great story. And, you know, yeah, and in, in recent years, we've seen the rise of streaming platforms like HBO Max and Netflix. How have they changed kind of this industry from an actor and a producer's point of view? Oh, man, it's the it's the Wild West, dude. Like, <laughs> just, it's like you're on a runaway horse. Like, you better like I don't. It, when I first started producing movies, we were going kind of small theatrical. It was the whole independent film festival market. You were hoping to get bought. Then you went to like DVDs. Remember those? Yeah, they were at like Walmart. You then went to, and like, <clears throat> that's only seven years ago. Yeah. And as of like three years ago, and I think the, I think it was already happening. And then the pandemic really sped things up because everybody was at home and everyone was streaming content and there was a need for content. So our company had four movies that were kind of on the shelf, like waiting for this again, is it going to go to a festival? Is it like small theatrical? Where will it get bought? 
And we sold all four to Netflix in one day because Netflix was desperate for content. Because mm. and and it was kind of like, well, yeah, that's then we're desperate to get it out there, and there won't be a premiere, and we won't. I mean, nobody's going to theaters, and so I think it is. I think it's amazing because I think that the kind of small budget independent film market has a way to, I mean, Netflix has 400 million subscribers. Like yeah. this small, I believe in Santa movie will be in every country on the planet. Like that is, I mean, that's, that's such a far reach. It's so inspiring. It's so exciting to get your, get your things out there. Um, I mean, I think, and I think it's continuing to take shape. We'll see. We'll see where it all lands.